Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us right here on The Right View. We're going to call this Tea Time. We used to call it Ladies Tea, but I'll tell you what, the guys have a lot to say as well. Let's welcome in our two tonight. First, we'll start with the ladies, host of Counterculture, Danielle D'Souza Gill. Welcome back, Danielle. As well as first time with us, Prager U's Aldo Budazzoni, whose new documentary, MIA Masculinity in America, is coming out soon. Aldo, welcome. I got to change it because you guys do have a lot to say. It's not just the ladies over here who are frustrated with the craziness going on. Before we get started, I did just look into a little bit this masculinity in America. Give us a sense of what that's about because I think it sounds fascinating and very timely for all the crazy going on. Well, I'm glad you're giving the men a uh, platform to speak here <clears throat> because that's yeah. what the that's what the documentary is all about. You know, we want to we want to give uh, a voice to the young men that are growing up in a society right now that is really seeking to vilify uh, and demonize traditional masculinity. And it's leaving men without a sense of identity, a sense of purpose. And as a result, and we're seeing this play out, we're seeing young men that are lashing back out at society. We're seeing weak men, we're seeing bitter men. Um, and that's really because there's no institutions, the infrastructure that we used to have to foster and to build a, a healthy masculinity, a healthy you know, stock of young American patriotic men is is dissolving or non-existent anymore. And so we want to we want to shed light on this massive issue so that we can be a society that values and encourages men to be strong leaders that that our society needs. So yeah, it's I, it's an incredible documentary um, and I, we can't wait for everyone to see it. And when when can we see that? It's going to be releasing tomorrow. So you guys can head on over oh. to PragerU.com and uh, get that there. Fantastic. Well, we need more of it. I'll tell you what, I have a six year old son and I sometimes I look around and I'm like, what what are we doing to our men? Uh, let's face it. If you are a white man in America, you were the enemy of a lot of people and you were basically told that everything you do is wrong and you should be ashamed of yourself literally just for being born. It is. It's insane. I'll tell you someone who is not ashamed of himself at all under any circumstances for anything he's done is Hunter Biden. He feels pretty good about things. He, of course, got the um, got the call that he needed to come in and and talk to Congress, and he decided he wasn't going to do that. He defied a con congressional subpoena and was willing to speak out, uh, Danielle, in front of the public in a an open public forum, which, of course, would afford him somewhere in the neighborhood of four minutes to talk versus allowing Congress to really dig in and see what's been going on with Hunter, with Joe, with the connections, with all these various entities out there around the world. What does it all mean? Hunter Biden right now, by the way, faces around 20 years in prison if he's convicted of all of these crimes. And he is now saying, Danielle, that if Donald Trump wins the election, he is going to have to flee the United States of America. Sounds kind of like the typical liberal victim mentality that we always hear. This has everything to do with Donald Trump winning, no accountability for Hunter, and actually the crimes he has indeed committed. And I don't know, what do you think? Is Hunter a flight risk? What did you think of that? Oh my goodness. Well, classic, the liberals always claiming that they're going to flee the country if Trump wins, yeah. one, which they never end up doing. Um, but I think Hunter is trying to paint himself like he's a big victim, like Trump is the dictator, like he's going to come after him if he wins, when the reality is the complete opposite. Our police state is going after Donald Trump, and far from being someone who's going to be, you know, a dictator, Trump is actually someone who is literally, you know, being prosecuted and all of this completely unjustly. Whereas Hunter Biden, who actually has committed crimes, he's the one who just gets a slap on the wrist and really barely anything happens to him. And so I think when Hunter's reacting to all of this saying, oh, you know, poor me, I just want to be able to kind of tell my sob story to the public, it's because he's not used to being held accountable for all these crimes. And the Biden family has been doing this for many years. Joe Biden has been in politics for, for decades. And so I think it's really just so foreign to them to actually be held accountable. And so for someone like Hunter Biden, I mean, he's basically gone his whole life doing this. And so it's probably um, his one chance to kind of say like, oh, you know, poor me, I'm the victim, even though in reality he's been you know, using his connections, using Joe Biden in order to make money and be corrupt and not just, you know, be 
doing drugs and all of this, but also to really put our entire country's national security at risk. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the big thing for me, Aldo. I, look, obviously, we know Hunter Biden has committed crimes and we don't have to guess or do any real deep investigation because he took photos and videos of himself driving really like high over the speed limit. I don't know what was he doing, 120, 160 miles an hour while he was using drugs with prostitutes. Um, he's actually committed real crimes. We know about the, the federal gun law that he broke, obviously. And then you compare that sort of as Danielle just said with my father-in-law who Joe Biden's entire Department of Justice is hell-bent on taking down. They're having to make up things to try and pin them on Donald Trump. And instead of saying, oh, I'm going to have to flee. Oh, I should back out. He's facing it head on. He's like, absolutely not. I'm not backing down from this. I'm not taking any of this lying down because I haven't done anything wrong. We don't have to guess whether or not Hunter Biden committed crimes because he actually did. But the really scary thing is what does this actually mean for the United States of America? Because if indeed Hunter Biden was leveraging Joe's position as vice president of the United States, at least we know that during that time there were some really questionable things that happened in order to enrich himself, his dad, Joe, 10% for the big guy, the entire Biden family. We know some grandkids of Joe Biden's actually got money from foreign countries. That is a national security issue. And that really is something that the United States Congress wants to get to the bottom of. Shouldn't yeah. we be doing more in order to figure this out? Well, th this is about the rule of law. And Hunter Biden is scared or claiming that he's going to flee the country, not be not because he believes that Donald Trump will unjustly pr prosecute him or, you know, go after him. It's because he knows that Donald Trump is the president of the rule of law. And under the rule of law, even the president's son, Hunter Biden, should be held accountable for the crimes like you just said he documented and not just documented them like here and there and wrote it on a piece of paper. These are crimes that he videotaped and he documented. <laughs> Documented with great detail for the world to see. And the fact that the, the Biden's uh, Department of Justice has not pr prosecuted this yet or looked more into it, and even the fact that the right, that Republicans haven't gone more into this, really speaks to the power, I think, that the Biden administration has. And I think you're right. I think questions need to be asked about who's pulling the strings here. Who did he do favors to? And why is this not coming to light? Yeah, well, it's funny, too, because Hunter also said uh, that the Trump cult Whatever that means, Hunter, is obsessed with him. And by the Trump cult, you mean people who love this country, who want gas to come down to $1.87 a gallon, who want inflation to come down, who want us to have a secure southern border. If that's what you mean by the Trump cult, no new war started, peace agreements in the Middle East, trade deals with China, then I guess that's the Trump cult we're talking about. Trump cult is obsessed with him. Um, I would actually argue, Danielle, that the Democrat cult, and I will call them that because these people are 100 percent a cult. They brainwash people. You have people who you can look dead in the face and say the mask isn't doing anything and they will still put a mask on still to this day. It's a cult. Those people are obsessed with with Donald Trump. It is full Trump derangement syndrome. There are no two ways about it for me. Um, the, I don't think anyone is obsessed with Hunter. What we are obsessed with is wanting to know that this country is indeed in the hands of people who are making decisions based on what is best for we the people, best for the country, and not best for the pockets of their own family. And right now, we really don't know the answer to that. Yeah, we really don't. And I think the fact that Hunter would even say like, oh, Trump is obsessed with me. It's like, first of all, we didn't even get to dive fully into Hunter Biden's laptop. I mean, that story was yeah. ahead of the 2020 election. So this idea that Hunter is like at the center of everything, it's like actually he would have been at the center of everything. But unfortunately, we were not able to discuss the facts there. And so Hunter has been skating by and he's been kind of in the background. But in reality, I mean, we should be discussing it openly. There shouldn't be this, um, you know, taboo as if it's like, oh, you know, we can't discuss this because of censorship and all of this. So everything has really gone Hunter Biden's way in a way. And I think now that we're 
um, kind of seeing all this come to the forefront. We're seeing him hopefully be questioned. We're seeing some of the Republicans stand up and say, no, we want to investigate this further is really just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that's just the smallest possible thing that could happen to Hunter. But I think on our side, we see it as, okay, at least something is finally being done about this, you know, years on, on onward when it could have been done before. Yeah. Uh, something that was interesting to me, Aldo, I want to get your take on this. So the Washington Post does not like, this is no shock to anyone, does not like Donald Trump, does not like anyone in our family, leans very, very far left, is always in the pocket of the Democrats. Whatever they need, they'll give them a boost. Whenever it's a conservative, of course, they're going to write anything a negative and, and something that'll be harmful to them. There was an article that the Washington Post put out um, about James Biden, and I found it very interesting in the same way I find it interesting that outlets like, say, CNN have been covering more and more information on Hunter Biden and all of the issues he's dealing with. So the Washington Post article talked about this D.C. consulting firm called Lion Hall that James Biden ran in the 90s. And in 1998, when Joe Biden was a senator, you had his brother James running this consulting firm. And um, I guess it was so that people would go to him and say, hey, we need a little love on this bill that's going to go through Congress. Could you perhaps wink, wink, nod, nod, talk to your brother and see if he would move with, uh, you know, what we want? And oh, for your consulting work, here's a little cash. So an attorney was trying to get a bill passed to force tobacco companies to pay billions and billions of dollars. He ended up paying James Biden's firm somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 for Joe Biden to ultimately 180 degrees change his opinion on the bill from where it started and end up backing the bill. They say in the article, when a larger version of the tobacco settlement finally reached the Senate floor in June of 1998, Biden had gone from being one of its biggest critics to becoming one of its lead defenders. Now, what's interesting about this is obviously it's kind of gross, but we all know that this sort of thing happens. What is interesting to me about this is that it's in the Washington post. And in my mind somewhere, there's been a whole group of people who have rallied together, the CNNs of the world, the Washington Posts of the world, Aldo. And they're like, we know Joe Biden cannot win in 2024. He doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of becoming president a second time around. So we got to make some moves. We've got to put out some dirt on Joe and the family. I don't know. I found it very interesting that this was reported in the Washington Post. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I, I think it's clear by now that the corruption of the Biden family runs very deep uh, and it goes back a very long time. And, you know, we see the same stuff today with Hunter Biden selling his art for very yeah. high prices. Uh, <laughs> apparently he's a world class artist all of a sudden. Chinese, Chinese <laughs> buyers, by the way, Aldo, shocking there. All the Chinese buyers of that very, uh, very nice art. It must be you know, right on the I'm walls. Not, I'm not a big fan of contemporary art, but I, I'm still shocked at how much uh, a finger painting by Hunter Biden is going for. Yeah. Maybe I'm just not it, you know, with it, with the new trends, but it's surprising to me. But yeah, I think you're right with the mainstream media and with the Washington Post uh, getting out here. I think the, the writing is on the wall that the Biden administration, as, as Trump derangement syndrome as the left is and how crazy and radical the cult of the left has become, uh, I think his performance has spoken for itself and he's driving our country into the ground one day at a time, one bill at a time, lining his pockets as he does so. And so I think even, even some people on the left and even the mainstream media is starting to realize that this isn't gonna be a su successful campaign uh, and they have to get out there in front of it before it blows up in their face. I know, and I'm just wondering, I mean, in my mind, Daniel, there will come a moment where they're like, you know, Joe Biden would like to come out and make an announcement. Joe comes out, stumbles out, they get him in front of the camera and he has, you know, takes a moment and he talks about his son and it's a tough time for their family and they can't possibly go forward in a presidential campaign. And now's the time when his family needs him. Something like that. But D Daniel, who are they putting in? Is it Gavin? That's the obvious choice. Is it old Hillary who's going to jump back in? Because we know she would love to. Is it Michelle Obama? 
What, who do you think the Democrats have waiting in the wings to swoop on in? Do they keep Kam- uh, Kamala Harris? My God, where's she been? Nobody's heard from her in a long time. That <laughs> She needs to go down to the border. Who are they going to put in? Wh- who are they going to use? I don't know. To be honest, I really think that Biden is going to run. I mean, barring really? some kind of health issue, I really think so. Because bi- the Bidens, they're very greedy people. I don't think Biden, or maybe even not, not himself, his wife, his family, they're not going to want him to step down because then all of these shady dealings we've been talking about come to an end. They don't have influence anymore. No one can pay them for anything. And so I think when you're president, you're probably thinking, you know, if I can keep doing this, I'm going to keep going. And so I don't think Biden's going to want to back down. I mean, well, I don't think he's going to want to. In my mind, you you have to have, you know, the support of like the DNC. You have to have the general support <laughs> of certain groups of people, right? The problem is I think all these people are panicking because you look at these polls across the country. Joe Biden is losing in head-to-head matchups with Donald Trump in all the swing states. He is now losing in some swing states to even Nikki Haley. I mean, she's come polling like third in, in the GOP field. So I don't, I mean, I just can't see how anyone over there, they pulled a fast one on us, if we're being honest, in 2020. And some people fell for the old sleight of hand, fell for the jazz hand of the Democrats because they can campaign this guy out of the basement. Oh, we got to keep both. We got to keep Joe safe. But don't worry, he's going to bring dignity back to the White House. This is old Scranton Joe, Uncle Joe, nice guy, going to get things done for this country. He's going to be real even keeled and just work things out, smooth out the wrinkles. And by the way, the exact opposite has happened. We are on the verge of World War III. We have had millions and millions of people illegally enter our country. In the past fiscal year, we've had 169 people on the terror watch list come over our southern border. 169. Are you kidding me? So I I cannot see how any of the people, the powers that be, are going to allow Joe Biden to do it. I agree with you, Daniel. I think he wants to, because this has been the this has been them on the take forever, and they've been waiting for this moment when he's in the White House. But do you think, Aldo, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let me just expand on the uh, the decency part of the Joe Biden administration oh, for a yeah. second. You're absolutely right. We had the highest number of illegal immigrants at our southern border in the history of the United States back in August. Uh, we have trannies topless at the White House. We have uh, people having gay sex in the Senate hearing rooms. Yeah. We have the only way that they can clean up San Francisco is if a dictator from China if comes over. We have feces <laughs> all over the city. And the only way they can clean it up is this Xi Jinping is here. So if that's what decency back to the White House is, then he has definitely brought it back. But I agree. I, I don't think I, I can't see a world in which logical people will, will keep him in. Um, and if you know, if you look, if you want to see who they're going to run, you know, who do they hate the most? They hate the white man. And what's the antithesis of that? You have the black female. I think they're running Michelle. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Mm. Yeah, I've I've had my eye on Michelle for a long time. She has a very high likability rating across the board with Republicans as well, shockingly. But um, I don't know. It's going to be a very interesting year because we are less than a month away from the Iowa caucuses. We're, we're here in the holiday season. Everybody enjoy it because I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> the next 11 months are going to be full-blown chaos. So everybody buckle up. Uh, while we're talking about Christmas, the holidays, Merry Christmas. We can say that again. Thanks to Donald Trump. He brought Christmas back. We know the Democrats are always on the lookout, though, um, Danielle, to, to try and ruin anything that's good. They take They suck the life out of everything suck the funny out of comedy all the entertainment sucks because you got to have dei you can't tell just a general story about anything you got to make sure you have certain people in certain places or you can't win awards they just suck the life out of everything and they're trying of course to do it to christmas you have the boston mayor michelle Wu, who um decided to have a little holiday party last week i'm sure a lot of people heard about this she sent the invitation out to the entire city council there in Boston, of which you have six minority members and six white members. And she told all of them, please come join us at our holiday party for electeds of color. And then about 15 minutes after this was sent out, of course, she had her uh, assistant or secretary or whoever this person was retract the invitation to the white folks and say, no, no, You are not invited. Only people who are electeds of color, as they put it, 
are going to be able to attend this party. And like one of the guys was like, I really don't care. It takes a lot more to upset me than being uninvited from a party. Quite frankly, I have Jomo joy of missing out. That is one of my favorite things <laughs> in the world. Invite me to something and then be like, <clears throat> I'm not feeling great. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's tough. And I'm like, Oh, fantastic news. So whatever. But the whole point is Danielle, imagine she sent out an invitation for a whites only party and said only the white people are invited. How on earth you cannot look at this and say that this is full blown racist. I don't know. And then they, they went ahead with the party. They actually had the party. Wow. Yeah, this is full blown racism. And just to quickly say what we were talking about before, before we dive into this, I think that they always underestimate Trump in the polls. And so I think you're so right. Trump is so ahead. But for some reason, they always underestimate him. And so I think yeah. it's going to totally blow them away, whether it's Joe Biden or someone else. But yes, this is totally racist when it comes to this party. And what's sickening is the fact that this woman apologizes, but she doesn't actually apologize for doing this, for actually having this racist event of, of segregation. She apologizes that we found out about it, that she sent it. Yeah, she's sorry she sent the, the invitation. She's not sorry she had a party where right. white people were told you can't come. Right. She's like, oh, you know, everybody makes mistakes with email as if like technical glitch. I'm sorry about my technical glitch. But the reality is she should be sorry about this entire concept. And of course, we know she's not sorry about it because then she says, oh, we've actually been doing this for years. This is kind of a tradition and this is a normal thing that we do. So it's like, OK, well, if you've been doing this for so long, then obviously you're OK with it. And so I think the fact that more white people actually, or a person of any color, doesn't find this more outrageous shows yeah. that the left has succeeded in a way of making us almost just like beaten down. I think people just feel like, oh, another crazy thing. Oh, another thing that happened. And it's like, no, this is straight up racism. Like you said, what if this happened the other side? That would be outrageous. Yeah. I would be outraged regardless of who this happened to. Well, right. So and, they can't just back down because of that. Well, and this is, I mean, these are people, Aldo, who are promoting segregation. That's what this is. It's segregation. Here you have the Democrats, the party who likes to call themselves like inclusive of everyone, the party of inclusion. We want to include everybody. You don't want to hurt anyone's feelings and inclusion, inclusion. Meanwhile, they are the opposite of that. This is continuing to cause segregation. Whenever you say only these people can come and these people cannot, you are segregating people. I don't know wh what the point of this, what is the goal? Why would you do this? Well, listen, I, I never want to be at a party that I'm not welcome at, but the yeah. problem I see here is that you're a government official whose job it is to represent the the people that elected you. And if I was one of her constituents, I would be asking the question, is this a, a policy and is this the way that she behaves in, in all of her affairs, that she uses race as a basis to segregate people? But I think the interesting thing here is that she's all for segregation in the workplace, but when she goes back home, segregation is, is something that she's against. You know, she wants a black only party at, or sorry, an electeds of color party at work, but then she goes home to her white husband. So uh, there seems to be a trend, I guess, amongst the, the leftist uh, uh, people of color. Um, you know, it's the same with Kamala Harris. It's the same with AOC. They love to, to bash white people publicly, but then they go home to their white partners I find it a little interesting there. I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's just gross. And I, I'm just done with it. If you if if you want to do the best thing possible, invite everybody. Are you serious with this nonsense? It's so crazy. I don't know. I really don't know what the point of it was. But the fact that they went on with the party, and I, I think, Danielle, as you just pointed out, the fact that this party's been going on for years, and like, oh, yeah, this is a tradition. We do this in Boston every Christmas. Wow. Congratulations for you guys. Maybe <laughs> one of the worst, most segregated places on earth, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we know that the lockdowns were really bad, right? We've we've known this for a long time. And you think back, I just want everybody to think back really quickly to where you lived during COVID. I started in New York City, one of the worst possible places you could actually be if you had to deal with the lockdowns and the nonsense, people got so crazy in New York. Uh, you know, Kathy Hochul put all these mandates 
Um, you know, the city of New York had all these different crazy mandates, locked everyone down, only like three people in a grocery store at a time. It was an absolute nightmare. And then I moved down to Florida. And I'll tell you, it was a completely different animal down here. People were free to do whatever they wanted. You could you could go out to dinner. You could send your kid to school. You could keep your business open. And it was actually a fantastic thing for the economy, for the entire state. So we know already that the lockdowns were bad in so many ways. But now they're uh, have we've got some Gallup researchers who have released their findings on the lockdowns and how bad they truly were, Danielle, for the people of this country. We right now, post-COVID lockdowns, see a record high one in 10 high school students attempting suicide. The general suicide rate, by the way, is through the roof. I think it's also at a record high right now, just across the board. The sedentary lifestyle, the work from home stuff, uh, and poor eating habits has have led to obesity doubling during the first year of the COVID lockdowns, during the pandemic. And, and so for me, like, this is something I think we all knew it was bad. It was bad mentally for people because you couldn't see one another. You couldn't travel. You couldn't do anything. Uh, we have real proof that it was physically and mentally terrible for people. And let's never make that mistake again. Absolutely. And I think what's what's so sad about it is those years are lost, especially yeah. Think of those young people in school, people in college, like they're never going to get that time back. And so a lot of them don't have friends from that time period. They didn't learn things from in, in that grade. When they look back, they say, oh, you know, actually I have the reading level of a sixth grader, but I'm in eighth grade now and so on. And so that's really just crazy. But you mentioned suicide and those things. And of course, um, I think the mental health aspect of this is something that that conservatives are actually on the front lines on. I mean, we're the ones saying that, hey, like this is actually a serious issue. People need to be around other people. People need to socialize. You can't just live in a hole, especially not for a year or longer, two years and so on. And then if you do see people, you're covered with a mask. You can't even see anyone. Um, if you're around a person, you can only have like one or two people near you. And so it's just gotten to the point where it's like, the left is wanting to control and micromanage every single element of where we go, what we do, what information we learn. And it's just not a way that people can exist, especially in a free country where we want people to flourish and be happy. I just remember, Aldo, the um, the way that, that some people treated me. If I was outside, I remember I went for a run one day. This was, I don't know, up two months or so into COVID and was on a very wide trail, like a running trail out in the woods and uh, up in Westchester County in New York. You got, you know, it's like a six foot wide trail. I was on one side and then there's a woman coming at me on the other side who I'm not even joking was wearing a full ski mask with only the eyes cut out of it, how that was going to protect her from anything. I'm not sure. Uh, but I remember her coming at me and screaming at me and telling me what a horrible human being I was, that I was an outside wearing a mask. And they certainly made an attempt, uh, during COVID, uh, Democrats, I would say to make any conservatives or people who felt like mm, this is a little heavy handed what we're doing here. And I don't believe in this and I'm going to go with the science and I'm going to understand what's going on. And I don't not, you know, once we found out that those cloth masks were complete garbage, I'm not wearing them anymore. They tried to paint it as Republican propaganda, all of the lockdown, uh, pushback that we gave, we now know also, by the way, we talked about this a couple weeks ago on this show, that it actually damaged the brains of young children. It made them less likely to want to learn more information. It, it physically damaged their brains and the, the way their brains are working. I know for my kids, my kids are, are four and six right now. My son's class, like the six-year-olds, teachers in that class have told me, we have to kind of like take it a little easy with this age kid because they really did not get socialized in the same way that other kids their age would have, you know, early on. So we see a little bit of issue with that. It wasn't propaganda. It was real. We know the impact of it. And I kind of see, I, I still can't believe I see people out there wearing masks and, and in some ways trying to make people feel badly um, for doing anything other than their psychotic need to like follow the trend of what the Democrats are telling them to do. 
Yeah, well, you know, I don't think it takes a Gallup poll to know that lock people, locking people in their houses, closing down small businesses while leaving liquor stores open and basically shutting down the economy altogether would have negative consequences. But for the next pandemic that they try to plan, I am glad that we have the empirical data mm -hmm. so that hopefully we don't land into the same trap. But I think one of the silver linings of the lockdown is we got really to see how people would act under those circumstances. And we got to see how our governments would treat us if they had all the power. And what we saw is that the people that run our country, the people that run our lives and and have power really don't give a damn about us. And they will they will do it again. They'll lock us in our houses. They'll close the country down. Uh, and, and I was able to see that firsthand uh, in Michigan. I was going to school at Michigan State University wow. in Gretchen Whitmer State. I was right in her mm -hmm. backyard in East Lansing. Uh, and she was putting the elderly into in the cramped homes together. She was locking down the state and, and locking down gardening materials in Michigan while she herself was going up north to her cottage, uh, her and her husband yeah, together. Weren't they going out on the lake on the boat or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't able to go to my uh, family cottage, but her and her family, because they're the ones making the rules, they were able to do so. And I was at a point where like you, Laura, like I was 20 years old and I wanted to live my life. I was a healthy young man, wanted to go to school, wanted to live my life. And at the same time, I was having people yelling at me and assigning, uh, you know, morality to me based on if my mask was over my nose or not. And so I fled to the great state of Texas. I, I took a U-Haul and I moved down there and I was able to see how, how our states should have been run. Um, and I, I was running away from that, uh, that kind of authoritarianism. So it was it was ridiculous, but I'm glad that we have this data now so that hopefully we can prevent this this sort of tyrannical stuff from from going on in the future. And, and we, so that we can call out the, the people that are trying to do this, you know, in normal times, you do have a lot of politicians that try to have these authoritarian laws, but they're thinly veiled with this sort of, you know, altruistic intentions. But I think the pandemic really showed that their intentions are very, very clear and uh I, I think that next time, hopefully, we'll be better prepared to see to see through that. Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's no next time. I got to tell you something. I, I dare anyone to try and lock us down again. It is not going to happen as far as I'm I, concerned. I'm well, not complying. I'll tell you right now. I'm not doing it. I'm not putting a mask on again. I'm not doing any of that crazy stuff. And I think a lot of people feel that way. I, I hate to be, uh, you know, kind of a, what do they say, black pilled or very negative, but they, I mean, think about it. They locked us in our homes for years. They, they force an experimental vaccination against yeah. us. They shut down small businesses. But do you hear anybody still talk about that? It's almost as if You're it right. never happened. And You're so right. I hope it's not a next time. You know, I, I definitely won't be participating in that. But, you know, again, I hate to be negative, but I also see how human nature works. And unfortunately, the, the number one rule I always go by is the timeline is very long and people's memories are unfortunately very short. I, I mean, there is definitely a truth to that. Uh, the thing that I keep thinking about, though, is like I, I stumbled across these photos. I saw some over the weekend of me with my kids in an airport must have been three years ago. And my son, who was how was old was he three at the time had to have a mask on. Here's how stupid it was. Ready? Oh my, gosh. my son to go on the airplane had to have a mask on. I of course had to be fully masked to go through the airport on an airplane. My daughter who was one at the time didn't have to do any of it. Like what, what was the rationale in that? They were like, Oh yeah. Under, under three, they could keep the mask off. It was so, so dumb, so stupid. <laughs> You know, just, you know what I miss about hey. the pandemic is like the, the way that people got around those things. I remember seeing a, a photo of some guy, he put a pretzel in his mouth on the airplane yeah, and he kept it there for it four there. hours to get around the rules. <laughs> it's like, it is so outrageous, the crazy stuff that we did. But I stumbled across this photo this weekend and I was like, oh my God, I put a mask on my kid. But of course, I was like, I just want to get on the plane. I just want to yeah. get where we're going. My, like, it's hard enough to travel with toddlers, let alone with masks on them. My God, it was a nightmare. <laughs> but I just think that so many people are like, okay, fool me once, shame shame on you. You're not going to fool me again, though. There, there, Believe me, there are enough people out there that are never going to fall for it again. And I hope they were paying attention, by the way, up in Canada. Man, did they take it in Canada. That was a disaster up there. I can't believe the hell those people went through. Remember the truckers and people getting their oh, bank yeah. accounts shut down. I mean, talk about communism. That's like straight out of the communist playbook. Um, so they've got a lot of a lot of uh, work to do up there in Canada. 
clearly. I don't think people are over that. Something recently, though, Danielle, not to, to get off this topic, that happened in Canada is it was brought to a lot of folks' attention that there is a transgender 50-year-old man. His name is Nicholas Sapita. He goes by Melody Wiseheart now. And this guy has been competing against not other 50-year-old women, but in swim meets against teenage girls. We are talking 13 to 16-year-old girls. Now, first of all, if you are a 50-year-old, like actual born as a woman woman, and you really are a woman and you're 50 and you think that you're competing against teenagers in swim meets, I don't know. I feel kind of like sorry for you. Like grow up and like get get a life a little bit. If you're a 50 year old guy who is posing as a woman and you are competing against these girls, 13 to 16 year olds again, and not only just competing against them, but actually changing in the locker room with these girls, Danielle, um, I have a huge huge problem with that. This is happening again in Canada. And what's interesting is there was a a reporter who actually went to one of these swim meets and was trying to talk to the parents. None of the parents seemed that upset with this whole situation. It was, it was honestly shocking. I've never heard of something so crazy. Yeah, that's totally insane. And I think that's a big difference in America. I think people here would be outraged. Um, But I think that it's just, it's so sickening because I even was reading that some of the girls in the competition, maybe not competing against him, but were under eight years old. And it's like, you would literally be in a locker room changing with this man there. And I think the fact that these articles change the language, they say, oh, this woman is competing. And then at a certain point you think like, oh, there's a woman competing. But then you're like, wait a second. No, this is the 50 year old man who's competing. And so we can't give into their language because if we keep saying that the language is no man competing against teenage girls, then eventually people think, wow, yeah, that's totally messed up. This is not okay. Obviously the changing situation is horrid. I mean, oh. I, they were even saying that they were creating tents in the yeah. changing room in order to right. have, not be able to look at them changing. I mean, the thought of him looking at, any of these girls is is bordering on 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 pedophile zone and so i think we we should not have any any men of 50 years of old or any age with these underage girls um regardless of how he identifies and the idea that that's acceptance that that's tolerance that that's you know these supposedly good things that the left is pushing it's like no this is just straight up evil and outside the bounds of what's acceptable. Yeah, it's 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 gross. I'm sorry. It's really gross. By the way, uh, this guy has been competing against these young girls since 2019, Aldo. And here's, this one got me. He placed second in the 1500 meters. <laughs> he couldn't even come in first. You're 50 years old. You're competing against like 13 year old girls and you come in second. Wow, what a That's loser. That's the real story. <laughs> but right, the buried the buried the lead there. Here's the uh the statement from Swimming Canada and Swim Ontario who hold these swim meets. Swimming Canada and Swim Ontario believe swimming is for everyone. People of all shapes, sizes, genders, beliefs and backgrounds should have the opportunity to swim to the best of their ability with the exception that our registrants treat each other with respect and dignity and keep our sport environment free from harassment and abuse. That's their statement. Well, I don't know. I, I'll tell you one thing. If my daughter was competing against a 50-year-old man who then tried to come into the locker room and change with her, I would consider that harassment and abuse. I would have something to say about that. They really feel strongly that this is an acceptable thing, and it's honest to God, it is incredibly shocking. You know, that's really the tragedy of this whole race to the bottom of victim mentality is the people that lose here are the true innocence of society. And that's children, right? They, they, why do we, we, we don't tolerate in the left. They can't tolerate any abuse or harassment of people of color and transgenders. But when it comes to kids, when it comes to eight year old girls who are being, you know, uh, perved on by 50 year old men in locker rooms, well, that's okay because again, they win the they're the they're crowned the victor of the uh, the victim men uh, the victim Olympics. I think it's absolutely disgusting. And you know what? We should be outraged, and that's great. But at a certain point, you have to ask yourself, where are the men? 
Where are the fathers? There you Where go. are the concerned people that are going to take action against these people that are really destroying the innocence of young children? I mean, this is a crime. I, I can't think of many that are above that. And all we have is outrage. You have to ask yourself, when is outrage going to turn into action? Because I am over it and I'm ready to take action. This cannot go on any longer. It's absolutely disgusting. Uh, and I hope we see a follow-up article that says that there's action being taken. Yeah, where where are the men? Imagine as a dad, you found out that this guy's competing against your daughter. I mean, um, you got you better do something. I'm sorry, you better do something. It's it's a perfect way for us to remind people, Aldo, about masculinity in America, the documentary that you have coming out with Prager U. Um, I think, you know, we're we're really at a an interesting time and a really precarious time because I feel like we have really pushed the limits as to what our society can take at this point. To see stuff like this happening, I think is absolutely yeah. disgusting and outrageous. But we need to we need our men back. We need, you know, we've we have like the lowest number of military members in, in really history in America right now. People don't want to defend this country. Um, you know, we're we're just we're in a bad spot, and we need some real men. We need them to come back. Uh, I'm proud to be married to to one who I consider to be a real man. I'm going to raise my son that way. I'm sure it'll horrify folks on the left. I'm going to tell him he's a boy. I'm going to make sure that he is, is a stand-up gentleman and holds the door for women and does all the things that men should be doing um, and will fight for this country. So um, I want everybody, again, Prager you, right, for uh, Masculinity in America? Yeah, Masculinity in America, MIA. Okay, well, we're going to check it out. I want to say, Aldo, thank you for joining us uh, tonight on The Right View Tea Time. We're changing the name to Tea Time now. <laughs> Danielle, amazing as always to get your point of view on things. Thank you both. Wow. To everybody at home, as always, thank you for joining us. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, and follow. And we will see you back here next time for more of The Right View. Nothing is worse than being on a phone call that drops. Nothing is worse than trying to text someone and you can't reach them because your phone is out of service range. And nothing is worse than supporting these major corporations and companies who don't support us. That is why I love Patriot Mobile. They are America's only Christian conservative wireless network. They use every cell tower out there available to all networks so that they have the greatest 4G and 5G coverage nationwide, and they support the causes that are important to us as conservatives. If you go today to patriotmobile.com slash Laura Trump and use the promo code Trump, you will get free activation today. Again, that is patriotmobile.com slash Lara Trump. The promo code is Trump for free activation so that you can get a great cell plan and feel good about doing it. So I'm like a lot of people. I love to wear an Apple Watch, but I hate how it looks. And I scoured the internet to search for the best looking Apple Watch cases I could find, and I found it goldandcherry.com. They have absolutely beautiful watches, as you can see here. Everything is waterproof. Everything looks good with different outfits. You can get sporty, you can get fancy, but they are great quality, uh, made out of Delaware in the United States of America. And they have been kind enough to give me a promo code that I can share with you if you wanna get your hands on one of these as well. It's Lara. T L A R A T is the promo code to get yourself a discount at goldandcherry.com. And not only do they make Apple Watch cases, they also make great products for iPads and iPhones, keyboards, your desktop, everything you could possibly need. Goldandcherry.com. Use promo code Lara T so you can get yourself one of these today too. My name is Lara Trump, and I think Mike Lindell is a patriot. He is someone who loves this country, is willing to fight for this country. If you go to MyPillow.com today and use promo code TRUMP, again, promo code TRUMP, 
you will not only save money, but you will help us continue this show and other shows like it and help us continue the fight for the future of America. If you're listening right now and you want to get these products, go to organicbodyessentials.com, use promo code TRUMP, save yourself a little bit of money and do something great for your skin. One way to protect your money is by investing in precious metals, uh, gold and silver. That's always been a great way to make sure that you keep your money and you keep it safe. When you go to bh-pm.com, use promo code TRUMP. That way, if you decide you want to invest in gold and silver, you'll save yourself a little bit of money. If you want to get yourself some Kingdom Fuel protein powder as well, go to Sherwood.tv. You can use promo code TRUMP when you check out for a little bit of savings, and you're going to get a delicious, great protein powder to fuel you through your day.